Janet. I first got to know her through a mutual friend, and then I happened to be on call the night she was admitted the first time for liver failure. And then I was on call the night she died. Janet was an extraordinary person who lived her dying as well, or perhaps better, than most people live their living. Last year, you saw, Janet spoke before you here as the exception that proves the rule. People like Janet, who experience dying on their own terms, are rare. You almost have to be a physician in order to know how to navigate the complex, convoluted healthcare system in order to get what you want. By default, you will receive aggressive, invasive care. No matter how old you are, no matter how sick you are, even if it won't help you, unless you opt out loudly. A friend and colleague of mine calls our default protocols the end-of-life conveyor belt, a conveyor belt that has people receiving chemotherapy in the last weeks of their lives, or intubated, hooked up to tubes and machines in their last moments, despite the fact that it won't help them. The way we treat dying in America today is a public health crisis. So what can we do? Let's start with three concepts. Communication, community, and communion. All three share the same Latin root, communis, which means common. Despite it eventually happening to everyone, dying in America is somehow considered to be an uncommon experience. Uncommon and it's never happened to that particular person before, and on a larger scale, uncommon in that we believe it's an experience that fundamentally can't be shared, or that sharing it is somehow a cruelty. The resulting fear, isolation, over-treatment, and missed opportunities for human connection are currently killing people long before they die. Death is considered a failure in Western culture and in medicine. As doctors were taught that if someone dies, it's because something went wrong. And that can be true, but mostly it's not. Death is normal. It's inevitable. It's common. Which brings me to communication. Critical conversations aren't taking place along the way in order to make sure that the care people receive is care they really want and that they understand. The top line is that doctors have information they say they want to share, but don't know how. And patients say they want information, but in reality, many don't know how to hear it, creating a sort of negative feedback loop. Let's break this down. We know that 80% of people want to die at home. 20% actually do. The rest are dying in our hospitals, in our nursing homes, and other healthcare facilities. We know that 30% of people spend their last days of life in the ICU before they die. And nearly 60% of people are dying in pain. We can do better. Doctors want to engage, but a recent JAMA article suggested that nearly 70% of physicians haven't been trained to have these difficult conversations. We must do better. Communication training is fundamental and should be required of all healthcare staff. But research and experience also suggest that a huge barrier to communication both sharing and receiving, is around values. If patients aren't encouraged to think deeply about their values, they, their families, and their doctors can't know how to assess treatment options, which means 
they often default to accepting or asking for more treatment on the assumption that more is better. Sadly, unless it's more time with the people you love at the end of life, more usually isn't better. And if doctors haven't been encouraged to think deeply about their values and the belief that death is a failure, they'll avoid anything that might be perceived as giving up. Believe me, I see this a lot. Other doctors see a palliative care physician walk into a patient room and they take it as a sign of defeat. I understand. I remember being a medical student and meeting a palliative care physician for the first time. And I wondered why, with so much training, anyone would want to concede to death. Turns out, I was wrong, like so many people are, about what palliative care actually is. It's about so much more than just the end of life. It's a field of medicine that focuses on quality of life for patients and their families facing serious illness, and it can be used at any time during the course of that illness, not just at the end of life. That said, no matter the quality of care or treatment options, we will all reach a day when we're very near to the end. And my time training in the ICU has taught me that not accepting the inevitable can force unspeakable pain on the dying. And while incredible technology saves lives every day in our ICUs, we're also prolonging suffering for far too many people. Suffering that could otherwise be avoided, and suffering that may also be taking a massive toll on doctors and other healthcare staff, whose rates of burnout, depression, substance abuse, and suicide are of tremendous concern. So what can we do? I believe there's a radically simple solution. What if the entire healthcare system was geared toward asking patients one question? What are your goals and values of how you want to live your life? Then tailoring all care based on the answers to that question. 600,000 920. That's the projected number of people who will die in 2017 of cancer. What if we were to ask each of them, what are your goals and values of how you want to live your life? We'd get 600,920 different responses. There isn't a one-size-fits-all when it comes to end-of-life wishes. And this is where community comes into play. In order to tailor care to each individual's end-of-life values, we need robust communities. Medically, it requires a team comprised of a nurse, a social worker, a chaplain, and a physician. At home or in hospice, it also requires family, caregivers, and often friends and volunteers, each of whom needs their own networks of support. For no matter how much better we make the experience of dying, it will never be easy. And it takes a healthy culture around dying. End of life in America is not going to be the best it can be until we build the experience of dying into how we measure ourselves as a society. We must consider how we care for others through illness and death to be a primary measure of our civic health. We can learn from places like La Crosse, Wisconsin, a town with a population of 50,000, where 96% of the people who died in 2009 had filled out an advanced directive, codifying their conscious wishes about how 
they would like to die. Turns out, costs per person in their last year of life were lower in La Crosse compared to the rest of the state. But more importantly, doctors knew how to proceed, and family members didn't have to agonize about what their loved ones wanted. Or the state of Kerala in India, where 35 million people live, and an almost completely bottom-up, dispersed collection of individuals and small organizations provide community-based palliative care. Finally, ending well takes communion, which I confess began as a nice way to alliterate the concept of empathy. But as I thought more about it, it occurred to me that communion is, in fact, the perfect word. To me, it's sort of radical empathy, and that you're not imagining the experience of another, but instead you're inviting them to share with you the intimacies of their lived experience as it's unfolding. I sort of see it as a Vulcan mind meld, or the call and response of prayer, a very powerful affirmation that even while dying, you're part of the living, and that you're loved and valued, and that you have something to share that only you can share. A beautiful example of communion was Janet, bravely taking this stage last year and sharing her experience with you. Now, like many of you, I've gone to conferences and convenings of all sorts, trying to get a better sense of the world as it relates to my work. And in the realm of palliative care, there are some wonderful things happening. But it's still a small effort in a giant fractured system. And I can tell you that not enough is happening at a scale or speed fast enough to handle what's about to come. In America, 10,000 baby boomers turn 65 every day. Even if we were to have massive breakthroughs in longevity science, never in our history will such a large number of people die in such a short time span from natural causes. And to make matters more complex, causes of death are now largely chronic conditions which can require care for years. This is a huge challenge that we simply can't tackle from inside healthcare, nor should we. Ending well is a human issue, not a medical one. As I said, I've gone to scores of gatherings trying to figure out how to move the dial on improving the end-of-life experience. And it wasn't until I attended a talk on human-centered design that I finally felt I had found a way in. I realized that what I was fundamentally after was a conversation about living, not dying. And the questions that designers ask about who, what, why, and how are the questions that we need to answer. Yet, what I've learned is that in the medical realm in general, and in palliative care in particular, there are tremendously high real and perceived barriers to entry. I've met many seriously talented, smart people doing incredible work in their fields who are stunned when I suggest that they might have something to contribute to redesigning the end-of-life experience. So, how do we tackle this issue? I founded Endwell Symposium to explicitly invite anyone who's interested to join in changing how we die. We're bringing a diverse, interprofessional group of people together on December 7th in San Francisco to listen and to learn from each other. Our goal is to create a cultural shift one that supports new collaborations, products, protocols, and systems, and one that fosters new and existing networks of support. And I hope you can join us. Janet, 
spoke before you here last year. As you saw, she was truly, thankfully, and completely alive during the final months of her life. Let us all learn from Janet what it means to live well until the very end. Thank you.